now's the time you've been waiting for. She's been called the perfect choice for Chief Justice. During her confirmation hearing, which I was privileged to attend and testify at, and in three, not one, not two, three swearing-in ceremonies that I attended. Who knew that there were three swearing-ins for Chief Justice, right? From Governor Schwarzenegger to Chief Justice Ronald George to Presiding Justice Arthur Scotland of the Third District Court of Appeal, all of them told us that she was the perfect choice to become our new Chief Justice. Now, they all said that she was perfect because uh, of her mind and her temperament and her excellence as a jurist. Perfect is what they said. But what they didn't talk about was the effect that Chief Justice Tani Kantil Sakaui had on our community, what she means to us. She inspires us, as Gloria uh, just noted. She inspires us through her life of public service, by her example of hard work, and that despite her humble beginnings, she has attained the highest position in the California judiciary. So as you might expect, we Filipino Americans are quite proud of her, and, has quite, and she has energized our community uh, in ways that uh, we have not seen before. She is, by all respects, our rock star. I've told her this before. She is our rock star. We have Tani fever in the Pinoy community. <laughs> But what may be more surprising is that she has had the same effect on our Japanese-American brothers and sisters. They connect, the Japanese-American community connect with her because the Chief Justice is so close uh, to her family, Mark Sakaue, her daughters, Hannah and Claire, and the entire Sakaue family. They're all a part of who she is and what she brings to the table. So, the Japanese American community have embraced her as one of, our own, uh, one of their own. So when we thought about how best to honor the chief in this evening, this joint celebration, we thought, was perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our rock star, the 28th Chief Justice of California, the Honorable Tani Kantil Sakaue. I don't know where to begin. My heart is so full. I am so touched and so overwhelmed by your kindness, your thoughtfulness, your generosity. I thank here tonight the board and members and the organizers from PABA, from JABA. My heart is full with all that you have prepared, including this wonderful tribute to me and my family and my life. I thank all of my colleagues and brethren here from the courts. I've met you, I know many of you, I've reconnected with you, and I thank you for giving me your Friday night. It honors me that you are here. Thank you very much. In terms of the lawyers and law firms and law students that I've met here tonight, I'm thrilled, I'm touched, I'm moved by your interest, your being here. I am overwhelmed and I am humbled. Thank you so much for all that you've done. As I sit here and listen to tonight's event, and that it is a historical collaboration between PABA and JABA, I cannot help but think of the great history of this state, the great history all of us harbor, the great history of our bench, the great history that we have in this state. It seems to me that, I, that my strength comes from my life history. 
I took a circuitous route. I don't think that anyone could have said, knowing me in my years, that I would ever have become a lawyer, let alone a judge, let alone to the Court of Appeal, let alone to the Supreme Court, let alone to the position of chief. And I only have come by that way because of leaders and mentors who have come before me. And really, the first started with my family. I came from a family of hard-working folks who started in the fields. And when I saw the Tanikaling performed, it brought me back to my childhood of when I attended many, many Filipino community activities where all my Filipino godmothers would pinch me in the ear if I was running too fast, or give me a swat or a pinch in the bugan if I was acting up. And so when I saw that tinikaling, I kind of broke out in a little bit of a cold sweat. <laughs> and then I was worried because then I thought I might have to perform it. But, but they never let me perform it. I only got to move the sticks. <laughs> See, because I was a child in a big family of four, and I was the youngest in a girl. So I was an unlikely person who would ever go to law school or stand in front of a court or argue a case, let alone become a judge. But it was in those Filipino events, those Filipino community events, where my mother was secretary, my uncle was president, my auntie was president, <laughs> right? Where I saw a million coronations, and where there were a hundred dances, where you competed in beauty pageants, but no one told you that to win you had to sell raffle tickets. <laughs> My mother put me in those, and that you learn the hard way why you don't win because you didn't sell those raffle tickets. <laughs> you know how you borrow each other's clothes because no one can really afford the Filipiniana, so you end up wearing someone else's and someone else's. Um, but those events, when I grew up as a Filipina girl in the community, really taught me a lot. It taught me leadership. It taught me to be bossy but nice. It taught me to quiet a crowd with a shh, 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 shh. It taught me that Filipino eyes can kill with a look. All of these, mind you, serve you well on the bench. And it is to what I call my Filipina godmothers that I would return during the hard, challenging times of my career as a young lawyer and as a young judge. As you know, I'd go to the Filipino community events, and they would say, have you eaten? Are you hungry? And no matter what your answer was, they would feed you a big, a big paper plate of pancit and rice. And because that was the way we showed love and support. And that really helped me in the early years of trying to be a lawyer and a judge because I didn't have any role models for that purpose. I didn't know anyone. And you know, Gloria really downplays the major role she played that really all of us play unwittingly in each other's lives. When she said that everyone here is a leader, she's absolutely right. I first had the idea of becoming a lawyer when Gloria Ochoa came to speak to the veteran of foreign wars See, we didn't have bar associations in those days. And so my mother took me to see what we had never seen before, and that is a Filipina lawyer. Heck, we'd never even seen a lawyer, <laughs> let alone a Filipina lawyer. I don't know what Gloria said. I just remember looking at her up on that wooden stage and my mother elbowing me saying, you could do that. That was really important when the whole Filipino community turned out to see Gloria. And she didn't have to say a word. She just had to be there. And the same is true for you leaders. You just have to be there. So I tell you this because as I sit here, as I stand here, I am 51 years Filipina and 17 years Japanese. In the Japanese community, what I've picked up along the way to help me and aid me in my leadership as a judge has really been the kindness and has been the patience and the preparedness 
and the, and the poise and the elegance and the quiet strength of the Japanese people. What my husband calls gaman, the perseverance through grace, perseverance with strength under pressure, the gaman that was shown when the Filipino, well, the Japanese community was interned and other communities stood by. And so, being 17 years Japanese, of course, I identify with Jabba. And what I learned working, making Spam Musubi for the Obon Festival, <laughs> what I learned buying furikake and making Hawaiian popcorn and making teriyaki from scratch, is working side by side in the Japanese community with the Nisei, with the people who taught me and told me stories and showed me with quiet grace that they persevered. And so you take the leadership of the Filipino community and you take the leadership of the Japanese community and it makes up my history, which is a history I share with all of you that we all share. And what it makes in my mind is a different kind of leader for a different kind of California. Because that's what we've become, a different kind of California and a different kind of leader for that. And that's what all of you are. And what you don't realize it is that you are in, in the stream of your leadership. As Justice Moreno knows, at the Supreme Court, our halls are decorated with historical pictures of former justices, former courthouses, former chiefs. And what I get from all of that is I have my history. They have their history. But the point is, is that in the Supreme Court, we are placeholders. We are placeholders for leaders like you who will come forward, who where you will make your bones in law firms, in DA's offices, in public defender's offices, in trial courts, in the courts of appeal. You will make your bones and you will come up to replace one of us because that is the continuity of our history. And you will bring your strength and your leadership somewhere embedded in your community that you will bring. I took a circuitous route and no one could imagine how anything that I learned either in the Filipino community or in the Japanese community or growing up in, with farm workers or growing up among the Manongs could ever inform the kind of judge or lawyer that I would be, much like you. But I tell you, I think what informed me most about going into the law was as I was living in both of those communities, is that I, in the Filipino community especially, I was acutely aware of the fact that there was a time when my family couldn't own land. And so we had this really weird deal with whose land and what title and who owned what and why it was in someone else's name because of the attempt to circumvent the laws that prevented them from owning land. You know, I really didn't understand the story about why my uncle had to move out of state in order to marry his white wife. And I really didn't understand the fight against redevelopment when they offered us pennies on the dollars and tried to expect us to find someplace else to live. I really didn't understand those adult conversations that were had, but they left an effect on me that something wasn't right. And so I pursued that to get to the law, to get to a place to defend those who can't defend themselves. And so I found myself unwittingly in a place that I never thought I would be at the Supreme Court. You know, people talk about dreams, but I can't say that I actually ever dreamed that because that was too big for me to dream. So I tell you, as young lawyers, as young leaders, that your career path will take you in many ways, and some of it may not make sense. And so when you go through those career paths, it's important to pick up the best of what you can from every experience. And sometimes for me, the greatest experience was losing. The greatest experience was losing because it was only then that I really reflected on what happened and what I needed to do and how I needed to go forward. And even when you lose, you go forward and you fight the good fight the next day. Because it's at the end of the day when you look yourself in the eye, whether you win or lose, you know you did your best for principle. And that's what makes you who you are. That's why you're lawyers. That's why you're leaders in your community. And your future is so bright. You cannot possibly begin to understand 
the many riches that awaits you in this profession. I say this in part because our numbers in California have changed so dramatically, and they're continuing to grow. I mean, the numbers, the new diversity numbers came out in terms of judges or lawyers becoming judges, and so you know the numbers are going up incrementally. But we also know by looking out in this audience that this governor and the next few governors is going to have a powerhouse of a bar from which to populate the finest bench that we have here in California. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about just sort of the curiosity of being on the California Supreme Court. And I wanted to explain to you how, to me, I break down the job of Chief Justice of California. It really is three separate roles. The first role is Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, where I sit with six other justices and we talk and decide and resolve the cases. And that is probably the most well-known aspect of being Chief Justice of California. That is the role of being Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. An incredibly gratifying, wonderfully rich experience because of the members of that bench, even though we just lost Justice Moreno to the private sector. But the second role that people don't really think about too much as the role of the Chief Justice of California is the chair of the Judicial Council. And that is the statewide policy-making body of the California branch of California. And that is that judicial, that is that constitutional body that is responsible for the rules for complex civil litigation. That is the body that is responsible for the policy that instituted self-help kiosks in every court in the state. Um, it is a body that seeks to improve statewide administration of justice. And then the third role of the Chief Justice of California is the Chief Justice of California, and that is the head of the third branch of government. And so of these three roles, you would be surprised to learn how much of growing up in the Filipino community, being in the Japanese community, being a mother of two, uh, being a wife, being members of your community at large, being a Girl Scout leader, all the things that you are, all of the small things that you do not think about that inform you, that inform your, your experiences, where you pick up abilities, how all of that can come to play in all of those roles. Because I think I bring all of that to those roles. And you will bring that and your experiences to every role you take on, whether you're a PABA board member, a JABA board member, a SCALA board member, whether and whatever iteration your career takes you, you will bring a piece of you to all of those roles. And that is how we continue to define leadership. I admit that I am an untraditional looking leader, an untraditional face of the California Supreme Court, of the California Court, of the California period. But I will point out to you that you are the new face and you will make leadership your own by appearing every day, working hard, and bringing your history, bringing to the table all of the wonderful things that your community has taught you. And so I'm really gratified to be here, to be part of the historical event of bringing PABA and JABA together, because it is our history that defines us. It is our history that will take us forward. It is our history that turns into the present that will define California in the future. And you are the face of California. And when I speak to young groups like this, I often ask you if you can smell the fire. Can you smell the fire? Because the fire is in the air. And what that is, is the torch. And the torch is passing. I've just received the torch of the Chief Justice of California. But I hold this torch as a placeholder. I am a steward of that torch, and I will make every I will make every effort to keep the torch bright and alive for you because it next goes to you. And when that happens, my face will go on a picture in the hallway of the California Supreme Court. I won't be in that three-piece suit, and I won't have the white beard, and I won't have the skinny tie, but I too will be part of that history 
that makes the court great, that makes California great. But that all starts with you, and that all starts with your life, and that all starts with the experiences you bring to your, from your life to your role. So there is no wrong way to get to the Supreme Court or to get to the court or to become a leader. You just make it your way, and from there on, you lead. And so I am grateful to be here in front of you. I am humbled, and I thank you for all that you've done for me and my family. We are without words. Chief Justice, you are truly an inspiration to all of us. Thank you very much.